screen, I hope. Plug your computer in. <laughs> Can I? There we go. I got it plugged in now, I think. There we go. And of course, I'm recording everything I'm saying right now, too, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so tonight we're going to talk about AGV navigation and marker strips. So the homework that you'll have this week is going to be a little bit more intense than last week. Um, if you've previewed it all or looked at the week four homework, it's it, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. Um, so when we talk about AGV marker strips, you know, the ability to, to locate things along a path, the ability to to uh, take certain paths. So like this kind of, like when you look at this particular image, I can't see my little cursor here, but you'll notice there's forks for these, for these vehicles to go off to the right, to go to a charging station or go off to the left to go back to the main line or whatever the case is. And then there's another strip that kind of bypasses all the charging stations on the left there. You know, the, the question is how do we get an AGV to pick a path? Because right now, if I'm coming down that line and it forks left and right, how do I get it to follow one versus the other? We'll be able to do that tonight, by the end of the night. Um, so navigation versus marker strip. We've talked about this. Uh, the command get value MGD is just the tape detect. So if I wanted to detect if the tape is present or if the tape is not present, I'm going to use get value MGD. If I want to detect the tape position, I'm going to use get value underscore MGT. And if I want to look for a marker left or a marker right, it's get value MGM comma one or MGM comma two. What's the difference between a marker strip and a navigation strip? Polarity. polarity. So the, 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 the magnetic strip itself, we'll call it straight polarity on one side or north pole. You flip it over, we call it reverse polarity or south pole. It's just the polarity. So it's the exact same magnetic strip. We just flip it upside down. That determines whether it's a marker strip. And usually the marker strips, we shorten them up, right? So that the, the navigation strip is continuous, but the marker strip then is only a short segment. Usually maybe it might be a foot long, could be six inches long. It's not going to be as long as the actual uh, full-on navigation strip. So we talked about this where we're going. And at time two, it's zero, false, false. At time three, it's moving to the right. So it goes over to plus 25, and we still have marker left and marker right is false, false. We go a little further, we're still at plus 25. Again, that red dot is to the right of center on the magnetic strip. Therefore, it's positive. Mm -hmm. I go a little bit further, now you see the red marker that's detecting the location of the magnetic strip. And what does the green marker tell me? Marker. It, that a marker has been detected, a reverse polarity marker strip has been detected. And so now you can see down in the bottom at time five, marker right went true. Okay? So very, very important. All right, now this is different. All that stuff that we just talked about, we mentioned last week. This is a different animal altogether, what I'm showing you right now. So get value MGT, we've been using. Get value MGT determines the location of the magnet on the, on the sensor. So all the way to the left is negative 50. All the way to the right is positive 50. In the middle is zero. However, the way MGT works is it actually uses two halves of the magnetic sensor. And they do the two halves of the magnetic sensor for a very, very good reason. Um, that allows me to track left or right based upon what I want to do. So if I only want to look at the left half of the sensor, the left half of the sensor is only going to read from negative 50 to zero. The right half of the sensor is going to read from 0 to 50. That is a really, really handy thing to have, as you'll see here in just one minute. We'll kind of go over that. So negative 50 to 0 for get value MGT1, 0 to positive 50 for get value MGT2. So I got two halves of the sensor. If I just call get value MGT, then I'm actually just getting the entire thing is what I'm getting. In addition to this, we also have digital inputs and outputs on the, on the motor controller. So I think next week I'm actually going to give you guys the AGV kit. So each, each group of two people, you guys can kind of start thinking about who you're going to pair up with, but each group of two people is going to get a, a bin 
And then it's going to have the AGV. It's going to have the motor controller. It's going to have the magnetic sensor. It's going to have the batteries. Um, and I think next week will probably be a build-out where we'll actually build the AGVs, put the wheels on them, do everything, put the motors in them, bolt everything together, and we'll get it functional. We may not get it um, following a strip next week. We might just make, we could even just drive it open loop again just to make sure it's working. But that's probably going to be a night where we're actually just building the thing and making sure it works. Um, but also on the motor controller, in addition to just driving the motors, and getting that magnetic sensor feedback, we also have the ability to hook up digital inputs and digital outputs. Give me an example of a digital input. One. Oh, yeah, one. <laughs> Zero. Yeah, you guys are great. Um, <laughs> but what I meant was like the actual device, the field device that we'd use as a digital input. A switch. A switch, a sensor. So it might be that you're going to drive this AGV to a location. And you're going you're gonna to use maybe a proximity sensor or a photoelectric sensor to determine if there's a part there that you need to pick up. And if there is, you may stop and retrieve that part. If there isn't, you may, uh, you may just go on your merry way. Um, or the other thing is you could have a sensor on board the AGV that detects if there's a box on the AGV. So meaning maybe there's a, some sort of sensor limit switch, proximity switch, or photoelectric that if there's a... An, an item that I'm transporting, I know that that's actually on the AGV, I can trigger that digital input. And now instead of just looping around, that might say go to station two because you've got a box to deliver, right? Or you could even have a sensor that's going to measure, I guess it wouldn't be a digital input at that point, but you could have an analog sensor that would measure the voltage of the battery. What would the, what would the benefit of volt, measuring the voltage of the battery be? Recharge. Yeah, I could, I could program into my code to monitor that battery voltage and go back to a charging station if I get below you know, 11 volts or something like that, whatever voltage I need to do. So in the simulator, we also have digital inputs and outputs. We don't have to physically wire those up. We can, in the simulator, simulate digital inputs and outputs, like switches, okay, or analog inputs and outputs as well. So we get all of those available to us. Now, for the sake of the actual motor controller, this is what your Robotech motor controller is going to look like next week. Um, there are six digital inputs, but we are only we only have access to two of them, and the reason why is four of the digital inputs are going to be tied up by our optical encoders. What are optical encoders again? Tell us how far those wheels are turning. Yeah, it's telling us what those wheels are doing, right? It's telling us what those motors are doing. So basically, it's telling us the RPMs, how far they've turned, how many RPMs we've gone. So they're giving pulses to that motor controller. So I can say, okay, I'm commanding this motor to be 200 RPMs, this motor being 200 RPMs. If one of them's going 190, based upon the encoder feedback, I can speed it up to match 200. So I'm going 200 on both of them, right? Um, so, but because of that, each motor has two optical encoders. Four of the six digital inputs are going to be tied up by our optical encoders. So we, that only leaves us two digital inputs left. Now, I will tell you, we probably don't need more than two digital inputs. We might have a, an input on the sensor or on the, on the AGV that's going to detect if we've got a box with us. We might have a, a, a sensor that's facing out that's looking to see if something's there. So usually we got an Inny and an Audi. That's all we need. We don't need much more than that. To, to, so two is going to be fine. <clears throat> Hold on. All right. So these are all the commands we know at this point. Tape detect. Get value MGD. What is tape detect going to give me? This get value MGD. Uh, it's going to give me boolean. Either there's tape there or there's not tape there. Mm -hmm. uh, tape position. Get value MGT. What's that going to be? No, so tape position MGT is going to be negative 50 to positive 50 mm -hmm. based upon the location of the tape on the sensor. Left position, negative 50 to 0. Right position, 0 to positive 50. What about marker left and marker right? Yeah, true or false, those are Boolean. They're just detecting if a marker is on the right or a marker is on the left. Um, so in this particular case, notice what this AGV is doing. It's approaching this fork in the road right now. Can you see the two red dots there? It's actually sensing both paths right now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So in this particular case, if I was using 
tape position, what would I get? <laughs> You're trying to split itself. <laughs> I would get zero. That's exactly right. I'm going to read zero because I'm on. I'm equidistant from zero on the plus and the minus. It's going to combine the two, and I'm going to end up with a zero measurement there. However, if I was only looking at left tape position, what would I be reading right now? Whatever. Negative ten. Negative ten. Negative yeah. Like yeah. And if I was reading only right tape position, I'd be reading the other side of zero, right? Positive ten, positive twenty, or something like that. Can you think of a way where we might be able to tell it which path to take? Mm -hmm. Digital input. Digital input. Mm -hmm. So you could use a digital input and say, okay, if this input's on, it might be that the left fork, the left fork's going to take me to a location where I'm going to pick up a part. And the right fork might take me to a location where I'm going to deliver a part. So depending on that digital input, if the digital input's on, I have a part on board, I'm going to take the right path. If the digital input's off, I'm gonna, I don't have a part on board, I'm going to take the left path and go get a part. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. and, and all that is then is it's a pretty simple, you know, if then or else if statement saying, if this is true, look at this, look at get value MGM1, else look at get value MGM2. So really, I can ignore half of the sensor, couldn't I? I could actually ignore half of the sensor while I'm making that turn right there and make and make that fork in the road work is what I could do. So that that's an easy way to make it work. So calling the digital inputs. So I actually I guess I looked at this one. So an AGV loops through a system looking for parts that need to be retrieved. Each loop the AGV takes the right hand path at a fork. The next time through the AGV has a part on board as indicated by digital input three. How might we take the left the left with two of T's hand path, and you can kind of see here, it's uh, update inputs, left position, get the negative 50 to zero, right position, get the positive, or the zero to positive 50, and then get the value of the digital input. The thing there with DIN3, digital input three equals get value, <clears throat> underscore DIN, comma three. That's how I'm going to read input three. That's how I'm going to read in the Boolean value there, okay? And then I look at this, I say, well, if DIN3 is true, then uh, then tape position equals left position. Else, tape position equals right position and def. So now I know, I know I'm going to either follow this path or I'm going to follow that path. And it can be that simple there. So in addition to the digital inputs, the Robotech also has two digital outputs that we can use. Uh, and we we'll are call these, so if the digital inputs were commanded by uh, get value, uh, parenthesis underscore din comma whatever digital input you want. The digital outputs, instead of get value, they are set value. Why do we call digital inputs get value and digital outputs set value? Yeah, it's read and write. So get value, I'm going to read the digital input. Set value, I'm going to write the digital output. That's exactly right. We got read only versus, well, I won't call it write only, but read, all, read versus write. That's exactly, you, you're right on with that. So the command for that is set command underscore D out one. And then now, unlike the digital input where all we do is get value DIN three, now we say set command D out one true or set command D out one false. So now we're actually writing in a value. We're not reading in a value. We're now writing in a value. Um, so this could be, you know, it could be a, a, I don't know, it could be an electric actuator. It could be a pneumatic actuator if we had we won't have any air on board but it could be something that's going to maybe it could be a little just a little electric actuator that pokes up to drag a box off of a uh, off of a track or something to pull it onto the AGV it could be something as simple as that where we just need to turn this digital output on long enough to grab this box and then we can move on down our way so this is lab 4 mm -hmm. A little bit, little, bit, little bit different than what we've been working on, right? I think last week it was just a racetrack around in a circle, right? Mm -hmm. um, this week, we're gonna, our AGV is going to approach the fork in the road. We're going to pick the left fork or the right fork based upon something. Um, if I ever hit a right-hand marker, I'm going to wait five seconds. If I hit the left-hand marker at the bottom right there, I'm going to speed up. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to run across that flat, but when I hit this other right marker, I'm going to resume my normal speed. And then I have another left and right fork based upon the status of digital input three. So I always take the left fork if it's on and the right fork if it's off. And if, the left, if, the, if I take the left fork here, I also have a charging station that's going to be 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. This seems difficult to me. It doesn't have the wording on the homework. It doesn't? Oh, it does. It doesn't? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not on the track, it doesn't. No. But in the write-up, it does. Yeah, kind of. Okay. <laughs> we'll take a look at it. So let's do this, though. Before we get into the homework, let's do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bounce into, uh, let's all open up AGV Sim. This will be a good time to get your computers open. And a couple of things that we need to do. Uh, on Canvas... I think it's called Homework for Track or something like that. So on Canvas, if you can go download Homework for Track, that would be a good thing to do. And I'll let you guys work on that for a few minutes. You also want to make sure you have your, your AGV SIM profile. By now, you guys are probably getting pretty good at doing that. You probably know where to find it. You got saved somewhere on your computer. So you get the right mini bot. Right? We don't want that gigantic one that comes up by default. <laughs> then you got to go find your track which I think it's called Homework 4 Track. Yeah, there it is. Looks like that. So there's Homework 4 Track. While you guys are getting set up for that, what I'm going to do real quick is open up Notepad um, because I'm going to program in Notepad. Why? Because I want it to be big enough that you can see it from the back of the room there. Jeez. <laughs> Let's do, and I always type an option explicit just so I can uh, tell how big my font is. There we go. All right, so I'll give you just a minute here. Let me walk around the room and see if people are getting in. Ooh, I see track. I see Minibot. Looks like Abby's got it. Hang is surfing the internet. <laughs> yeah, good job. Nathan's on there. Yeah. Chris is checking his socks. <laughs> Blake's got a Blake's got an AGV the size of like a Zamboni or something. <laughs> Quick and big. You're, you're on your email. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, you guys are getting close. Uh, yeah, Andy Rose is already programming. Yeah, well, Matt Ringsman thinks he knows what to do and always follows the left track for Matt Ringsman. That's good. <laughs> and stops forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll give you guys another minute and then we'll uh, then we'll start writing some code. I wonder if I can pause the, the recording here. I think I can. All right, I think we're recording again. Me minimize that. Yep, we're recording. Right? Yeah. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do this in Notepad. You guys can do it however you want. Um, you guys can do it live in your in your editor, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're always gonna start out with option explicit. I do want to say one thing. I'd love to see you guys do, just because it would help me, <laughs> is the very first line under option explicit. Put an apostrophe. And maybe type in A E N T forty one forty, and then maybe uh, your name. As I was grading these, <laughs> the only thing I could look at was your code, <laughs> and and whether or not it was driving around the track or not. And then I would forget which one I downloaded. I forget which one I was on, and it just would be so much easier if it just said that. It would make my life so much easier when it comes time for grading. So. You should ask IT for another monitor. I should ask IT for another <laughs> monitor, um, but I'd be happy with just a comment. You know, I'd be, I'd take that. That'd be, they're free. All right. <laughs> so define a memory. So we know we're going to need throttle. We we always need that as an integer. That's that's honestly, you could probably take the code you wrote last week, and you could probably take the code you wrote last week and and use that as a template on this. I'm going to start from scratch. <laughs> But, but a lot of what I have here is going to be the exact same as last week. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to define the memory tape position. 
as as what uh, as what variable? Boolean? No. Take position as an integer. I was testing you there. <laughs> then I'm going to define in memory uh, right position, right pause. I'm going to call it as an integer. And I'm going to define in memory left pause as an integer. What have I? What am I doing by doing that? And now, right now, I'm just defining. I'm just defining variables, right? But, but what I'm what I'm doing here, right, is I'm giving myself tape position. I'm giving myself left half and right half. That's what I'm going to do. I want to be able to get the negative fifty to fifty, but I also want to be able to get the negative fifty to zero and the zero to positive fifty. Does that make sense? That's what I'm really after: is the ability to follow a fork if I need to. All right. And honestly, I've done this a lot inside of the. Uh, Inside a simulator, I've never actually done this with one of the mini bots yet, so that's something we'll be doing in a few weeks. <laughs> is we'll see if we can simulate it, and then we'll see if we can actually get it to do it with the mini bots too, because it's not quite as trivial with the mini bots. In the in the in the simulator, the motors are perfectly matched, right? They are <laughs> identical motors, right? In the real world, it's not quite that true, right? You know, you can have uh, the wheels could be a little bit different, the motors couldn't be quite perfectly matched, and and so they're going to spin a little different speed. And so there we go. I also want to define in memory what I'm going to call P gain. What is that what we did it before? Yeah. 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 What is P gain? It's an integer. It's an integer, but what, what does it stand for? P gain. A proportional gain. A proportional gain. So those of you guys had me for motors last semester, we did the PID loops. And those of you guys that had Anjana last semester probably did PID loops too. Now we got new PID trainers in Blue 60. Mm -hmm. They look really, really cool, all thanks to Donald. All right, and then we're going to define the memory. And usually, I don't like to do it here. I'm actually going to put it up here by uh, by throttle. I like them to be kind of paired up. So usually, I don't know why I didn't, but I skipped over steering. I usually have, I define in memory throttle as an integer. I define in memory steering as an integer. Those two are always going to be there, right, in our, our multi-mode our multi here. And I have one more thing. I need to get that, that digital input. I'm going to want that digital input to help cho choose the fork. So I'm going to call this DIN3 as, now that's going to be Boolean, because that is a, yeah, too bad I don't know how to spell Boolean. There we go. We're going to define the memory DIN3 as a Boolean. So that's going to be my switch. That could be whatever switch it is. It could be a, it could be a, a switch that determines if there's a box on board. In this case, it's going to be a simulated digital input that we're just going to click a box to simulate it. But it could be a proximity switch, photoelectric switch, it could be a limit switch. Any of those things would work. All right, now that I've defined throttle, P gain, steering, I'm going to give this thing some, uh, I'm going to initialize these variables. I'm going to call throttle. 400, I don't know why, I just picked a number, all right? Um, I'm going to define P gain as, what, what have we used for that before? 24,000. 24,000? Negative 5,000. Negative 5? And we had to do negative, right? Because if we did positive, it turned the wrong way, didn't it? Yeah. So let's do negative, and I like 5,000. I think there's nothing wrong with that. And then we're going to, now we've defined our variables. We've initialized our two variables. Why am I not initializing my steering variable? Where am I going to get that from? Yeah, so I'm going to read the magnetic sensor, and I'm going to multiply that by the gain to get the steering, right? So, so, so the, instead of me predefining a steering like you guys did when we ran open loop, right? In this particular case, the steering is going to come from the magnetic sensor itself. That's going to determine my steering of this vehicle. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to call the top of my main routine. So this is where I'm going to call all my subroutines. All right. And I might even I might even put a comment in here and call this uh, main loop or something, just to kind of remind myself what the heck I'm doing here. Mm -hmm. So these are kind of the different subs I'm going to call. Go execute this. Go execute this. Go execute this. In the world of PLCs, the PLC is going through a loop at all the time, right? It's, do, it's reading inputs, then it's executing code, then it's doing diagnostics, then it's updating the outputs. 
That's what we're doing now. We're actually defining that loop right now. We're defining what that loop is. And what we're going to do is the exact same thing a PLC would do. We're going to go sub, and we're going to read the inputs, or we're going to call it update inputs. I actually kind of, I usually do a capital I. When I have two words, I usually separate them by capitalizing the first letter in that second word. So we're going to go sub update inputs. We're going to go sub uh, get tape position. Tape position. I need that tape position because that's the only way I'm going to be able to steer, right? I need to get what that, that value is. We're going to go sub, follow, track. We're going to go sub, update, outputs. And really, that's, that's it in a nutshell. It's like read input, execute program, diagnostic communications, update outputs. But I really don't have a diagnostic communication. So I really have read inputs. Get, get my position and, and drive, and then update the outputs. And update outputs really is just commanding whatever that steering and throttle is to the motors, right? That's really what update outputs is. The, the what's that? Um, I think, how did I do it here? No, my update outputs is it. That's all my update outputs is. Yeah, you could call it drive motors if you wanted to. Then we're going to put in a weight, and I'll put 10 in here. Did everybody kind of get the gist of if if you make that that weight number too big, what happens? Weight. Yeah, we, we kind of figured that out here, right? That weight, if you make it a thousand, you're not your your robot's moving so slow across the screen. If you make that weight one hundred, it's going to move a little faster, and if you make that weight ten, it's going to move much faster. Now we want to put the weight in there because there is no sense in trying to run this loop at the speed of the processor. There, there's no benefit to that. Um, we, we don't have to sample that much to get good uh, to get good movement, right? So I'm just going to do the weight 10 and then go to top. So essentially that's my main loop. Go get the inputs, get the tape position, follow the track, update the outputs, real simple loop. Now we need to define what those subroutines are actually doing. This is where it, this is where it gets good. So update the inputs. That's the first loop we're going to call. Now we put the colon after it. That actually calls that statement as a subroutine now. So the call came from my main loop, and this is where it's going to go when it calls. It goes to update inputs. I'm going to tab over. I'm going to call this... Um, I guess that's fine. I'm going to say left pause, because we have that variable up here. Remember, we had left pause as an integer. We define that variable is going to be equal to what was the command we needed for just negative 50 to 0? Uh, MGT1. MGT1. So get value. Very good. Nathan's up there taking notes. I like that. Keeps me honest, too, because I don't remember what it is, although I've got most of my stuff written here. MGT1. Then I'm going to do write pause equals get value underscore MGT comma 2. And then I'm also going to get the digital input status. DIN3 equals get value and this was underscore din comma three those are the the inputs I'm gonna receive I'm gonna look at left position right position and din three um, yeah I think we're good I think we're good all right, so that's my update inputs. Whenever I'm done with a subroutine, what do I always have to do? Return. return. So I'm going to return back to my main loop by calling the return command. And then if I look at my, my list of subs, I have update inputs. That's done. My next one is get tape position. So I'm going to get get tape 
position, get the colon, and this one's going to be a little funky here. What I want to do is I want to, if digital input 3 is on, I want to follow the left fork. If digital input 3 is not on, I want to follow the right fork. What statement do you think I'm going to use? Yeah, yeah, if, if else or if then or else if. So I'm going to call this if din 3, that's my variable, equals true. I think you got to capitalize true. I can't remember. In Notepad, it's not going to change colors for me. For you guys, it's going to change colors. So <laughs> as you do stuff, then if din 3 equals true, what I'm going to do, this is where it's going to get kind of cool. I'm going to say tape position equals left pause. So I've got left position, which is only going to be negative 50 to 0. So if digital input 3 is on, only look at the left half of the sensor right now. Only look at that left half of the sensor right now. Okay? Else, I don't need to say... There is no need to say if DIN3 is false, because DIN3 only has two states, right? DIN3 is either true, else it's not. So my else then would be tape position equals what? Right. Right pause. So that's going to give me my ability to track the left fork or the right fork, depending on, on the status of the digital input. Every time I do an if, then, else, I always have to end with end if. I think it's, there's a, is, there, is there a space in there? Yeah. Yeah. And then return. In my notes here, I got drawn without a space. But I think it's actually end if with a space in there, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so that gives me my update inputs and my get tape position. <clears throat> Now I need a follow track. So I'll go down a little further. I'm going to go follow track with a colon. Follow track with a colon. And now I'm going to call steering. Did We, we had a steering variable, right? Mm -hmm. So we had, yep, steering as an integer. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to say steering equals... And I think what we did in the past was we just took tape position. Mm -hmm. We multiplied it by the gain, mm -hmm. P underscore gain. And then we divided it by 1,000. That's, that's exactly what we did last week, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Looks the exact same thing for follow track. That's all I need for follow track. Return. Done. Look how simple our code is right now. There's almost nothing here. <laughs> you know? Um, then finally, we're going to update outputs, colon, set command, oop, like this, underscore G, comma, one, comma, throttle, and then set command, underscore G, comma, two, comma, steering. And then return. And I'll tell you what, I, I think that's it in a nutshell. I think we got it. So why do you address it that way, set command? Why do I set command throttle and steering? Yeah, well, I'm just trying to figure out, like, what it means exactly so okay so you're always going to have two commands for, for for the two for the for the motors themselves if you're in if you're in independent mode set command g1 is the throttle of, of motor one and set command g2 is the throttle of motor two so in order to steer then i would have to speed one up and slow one down right to actually be able to steer but what we are, in our, our AGV profile, we set it up as what we call mixed mode. So instead of G1 being motor 1 and G2 being motor 2, 
Now G1 is only speed, and G2 is now steering. So now you've got a gas pedal, and you've got a steering wheel. Instead of having, like, if I ever driven a Bobcat, we have, like, two controls. Yeah. So you got to, like, push them both forward to go forward, and you do this. You spin around in a circle, right? Yeah. Um, so that would be if you weren't in the mixed mode, you would do it that way. That's why there's two commands. Right now, we're using it in mixed mode, throttle and steering. Otherwise, for not mixed mode, it would be motor one and motor two. But doing a motor one and motor two is more complex, right? Because now you got to control speed to both motors just to be able to get it to steer, right? Is that defined in the Minibot profile? Yes. In mixed mode? Yeah, so like when we went into the Minibot profile itself, um, yeah, and I don't think we spent a lot of time in here, but if you go into the Minibot profile itself, um, oh, come on, motor configuration, direct motor output. Boy, now I don't remember where it's at. It's in here somewhere. General, mixed mode one. There it is right there. So you can see the mixed mode one. I could have selected in there. I could have selected separate. And I will be honest with you, I don't know the difference with mixed mode two and mixed mode three. That's something we'd have to look at. Um, but the only two I've ever seen used are separate mixed mode one. And the mixed mode one works perfectly for what we want, where we want to keep the steering and the throttle separate. So this is how fast I want to go, and this is our steering wheel, is what we've essentially got. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all this code that I just wrote. I'm going to copy it. Now you guys wrote it right into your, into your, uh, into your window. Hopefully this comes in good. Looks like it came in pretty good. Um, I'm going to close out of there, and I'm going to hit go. Now when I hit go, I can see right now what's going on is my, my vehicle is tracking down the right-hand fork there, isn't it? Looks pretty good, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Now it's not doing anything when it hits those marker strips, though. It's just tracking down the right-hand fork. Now let me reset it by hitting the little, little circles there for the reset. Now this time, I'm going to turn on Digital Input 3. When I turn on Digital Input 3, up in the top up here, and I go to Run, now what you're going to see is that the vehicle now is going to track to the left. And we're going to see it go up now. We now have chosen between the two, the two regions. Now there's one thing that, that scares me a little bit. Is it not going to turn? Turn just fine. I agree with you, Matt, though. That's what scares me a little. Why, why do you think that scares you? Or why does that scare me? Because what I'm thinking is, if I'm only looking at the left half of the sensor, am I not going to be able to track the right half of the sensor? Well, let's go look and see what that looks like. So I think what we should do is in here, I'm going to add one more thing that we didn't do that we normally do. So underneath my subroutines, I've got update outputs. Let's add this real quick. Let's go sub. What's the thing we always put in there that we don't have in there right now? Print, print to the, print to the console. So print um, variables. I don't know what we called it. I'm gonna call it go sub print variables. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go. So that's right in my main loop now, because I want to look at these three variables and actually see what's happening. So Underneath there, then, I'm going to go and uh, create a new call here down here, print variables with a colon. And the command is print, parenthesis, quotation, space. Let's do DIN 3. Well, I don't even care about DIN 3, to be honest with you, because I can see if DIN 3 is on or off by the checkbox, right? So let's do left uh, left pause equals with a space. So those quotation marks are the string that I want to put in front. And then the comma is then the variable I'm going to call that's going to get, get uh, oh, what's the word, concatenated with it. Mm -hmm. So left pause equals left pause, right? And then, then we'll do another one. We'll do right pause. I get to use fun words like concatenate. <laughs> I don't ever get to use that word. So right pause equals this, comma, right pause. And then we're going to do one more. 
we'll do um don't we have tape position coming in too yeah we have tape position coming in too so then we'll do tape pause oop i gotta do quotations quotation space tape pause quotation equal comma but this one's actually called tape position so it's not called tape pause it's called tape position so i gotta be careful that i get the right variable there which i think i do and then comma and then quotation slash r quotation parentheses what does that little slash r do just a character turn is all this just goes down to the next line Donald had a different way. I think it was like new line or something. Maybe slash n is what he used there. I think is what he was using. Yeah. Which, uh, which does a similar deal. Um, but I'm going to do tape position. So what is this? And then I'll, then I'll call my return statement underneath this. But what is this print variable going to do for us? Give us a nice registry of what's going on moment yeah. by moment. So we can actually see the status of all those variables live as the robot's driving around and see what the navigation strategy is being based upon, right? Mm -hmm. So when we do that gain, what is it multiplying by? What's it What's it using for all this stuff? Yeah. Just, uh, so right? Over, yeah. There you go. And the reason why I put those spaces in between tape pause and equals and after equals is remember what we're going to do. We're going to take that string, tape pause, equals, and then we're going to actually plug the variable number in next to it. So what I don't want to do is I don't want to just stack them and squish them all up, right? So I'm putting a, a null character in there so it formats nicely for me. Mm -hmm. So I can see what it's going to look like there. And then i got to return at the bottom. So I'm going to grab all this code again. I'm going to copy it. I'm going to go back into my, my code in here. I'm going to paste it. Looks pretty good. I'm going to bounce out. I'm going to hit it. Now I'm going to pause it real quick. Before I even get to that, before I even get to that fork, I'm going to pause it. Right there, I'm going to pause it. What you can see right now is everything's tracking right on zeros, right? Left position's on zero. Right position's on zero. Tape position's on zero. Now I'm going to go a little further until it's just at the split. Boom. When I'm right at the split, what I want you to note right now is my left position is negative 14, my right position is 14, but my tape position is 14. Why? You, yeah, you would think if I'm averaging negative 14 and positive 14, I'd get zero, right? Why is my tape position zero or 14 right now? Because digital input three is what? It's off. And when digital input 3 is off, which half of the sensor am I going to read on? The right half of the sensor is 0 to 50, right? So if I let this go a little further, you can see it tracking to the right now. You can see left position. Well, now, look what happened. All of my positions now are 30. See how left position just defaulted to whatever was, was there now? Mm -hmm. So this kind of goes back to what you were saying, Matt. Well, am I still looking at the other side? You are. But it's going to be all, all that you get is what's there now. So now it's going to track to the right, and everything's going to be that, whatever it is. And it's going to go around and round and round, and it still is looking at those negative numbers. Now let me do it again and start over again. But before I get to that fork, I'm going to pause. I'm going to turn digital input 3 on. Now that digital input 3 is on, I'm going to hit go again. I'm going to get to there. Now what you'll see is now I have left position negative 15, right position 16, and now tape position went to negative 15. Why? Digital input 3 is on. Digital input 3 is on. I'm only concerned about that left-hand side now. That's going to be my default location. I'm going to keep playing. It's going to track to the left now instead of tracking to the right. And when it gets to that right-hand turn where we were, where we were a little worried before, We can see we still get those positive numbers. Do you see that? So even though left pause is the left half and right pause is the right half, I can still read beyond that point. 
So it's not like I don't have that point, but I'm I'm playing favorites to the left half of the sensor or the right. Does that make sense? Okay. So it's not that it's only the left hand. That's right. It's right. not throwing out those other values. Okay. If I only get one reading, I'm going to I'm going to get that reading and I'm going to use it. However, if I'm getting two readings, I'm going to default to this side. Is what's really going to happen there? Does that make sense? Because we saw that as soon as soon as I, you know, if I have DIN three on, as soon as I get to the to the fork and I hit pause right there, I can see that the negative twenty seven is what tape position became, isn't it? So that pretty darn cool, isn't it? We were running my program as if it was just going to space the second it started turning. Yeah. Well, you can, yeah, I mean, you might think that. You might, oh, well, if, I, if, I, if I'm only looking at half the sensor, but you actually still have the whole sensor available. Mm -hmm. Andrew? I just uh, did something kind of clever here. <laughs> I let it go, and then I just, like, rapidly click the uh, uh, digital three button, and if you're quick about it, you can actually get it to where it, you get to that point, and it, it hears the turn left, turn right, turn left, turn right too quickly, and it just keeps going straight. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> like, if I do it, like, really fast. That would be problematic. <laughs> Be, now, here's the question. If we look at the homework for this week, and I'm, I'm not ready to call it a night yet, by the way, but, but if I pull up the homework, I'm just going to look at it real quick because I want to talk about, because there's a lot going on with this homework. This is not a, a trivial deal here. So it, it does have it on here, man. Mm -hmm. uh, not the one you posted. Yeah, it does. Oh. It's slightly different. Is it? Yeah. You most of it. <laughs> is that what I'm showing here? No. Nope. Let me go look at it online real quick. Let me pull it up online. Let me pause this for a second so we don't need to get all... <laughs> yeah. That's on you. All right. So if we look at the homework for this week, let's just talk about what we might do here. So here's the homework. You're going to download the homework for track, which you guys already have. Write the code necessary to map... To navigate the map below. So if digital input three is on, left fork, if it's off, right fork. You guys know how to do that. You can copy paste that in there, you're done. Vehicle must start, stop, and navigate according to the markers below. So if I hit one of these right hand markers, whether it's on the left fork or the right fork, the vehicle has to stop for five seconds. When it gets to the bottom of the map, it needs to speed up. Oh, gosh, I didn't even realize this. When it gets to the other one, it needs to wait five seconds, then resume normal speed. Mm -hmm. And if digital input three is on after that, it's going to take the left fork. If digital input three is off, it's going to take the right fork. If digital input three is on, it's going to take the left fork, and it's going to go to the charging station. All right? Now, how can I tell the difference between... I mean, the, here's the beautiful thing, right? Every time I hit a right marker, what do I always do? Wait. I always wait what? Five seconds. Mm -hmm. so, so I've made it so all the right-hand markers are five-second waits. Left marker does what? Speeds up. Speeds up. And how do I signify the charging station from a speed up? Exactly right. Marker on both sides. Mm -hmm. It tells me when I'm at the charging station which the charging station has a different wait time, doesn't it? So that, that's important that I have a, a, a way to, to show I can have three different things going on simultaneously here, right? I can have three different markers. I could have right, left, or both. Mm -hmm. You know, you might say, well, I wonder what that looks like. Well, as an example... So you don't actually have the, oh, the digital input and okay. in there... To turn itself on. Oh, uh, you did well. So your digital input's already in there for left and right fork. You just click it. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Thought you had no, no. You're just gonna click it. This is not homework for solution, but uh, oh, I don't want to do that. Hold on. Homework for it's gonna say solution, but I only did part of it. I didn't actually do this whole thing. So like now when I run this, oop, stop, reset. So now when I run this. Is this this is the one I just wrote, isn't it? This isn't a new one. We'll see if it stops or not. Yeah, this is not the new one. Well, let me ask you this. 
How might we go about stopping? Whenever it reads that marker, it's going to be if statement. So if this marker gets said, wait, I've got some time to return. Do you think we'll Yeah, you're, you're, you're right on with that. So what we need to do is we need to find a way to where if we see a marker on the right-hand side, we tell it to stop and pause. That's what we're really after right there, right? So right now when I hit go, digital input three makes a track to the left side, digital input three off makes a track to the right. Um, but now we need to find a way to make it so that it pauses when it gets to that strip. Any ideas? I like what we did the last time when we have a conditional statement, like an if statement for driving the motors. Right now we're just telling it, okay, set the motors and just keep on going until, until you're told otherwise. But if we make it a condition, we can have as many conditions to that as we want. Absolutely. That subroutine. So you guys could, so you could create another subroutine if you wanted to, right? You could say, okay, here's all these, these routines I have that I'm going to call, right? And, and I've got my follow track. But I could also, you know, if I ever wanted to, I could create another one. Maybe I call it like ghost. Oh, let me do it on the big screen so you guys can see it up here. Oh, I hope I didn't close it. No, I didn't. So I could say down here, maybe I'm going to have a go sub, and maybe this time I have follow track, but I also have go sub. Uh, what do we want to call it? Like marker strips or something? Maybe we're looking for marker strips. So I'm going to, I'm going to create, i got follow track now, and I've got go sub marker strips. And that's, that's what I'm going to use to go, go read these these marker strips. Now we are, did we already read them though? Did, we didn't get the marker strips, did we? I don't think we did we declare those in memory. No, well, so we didn't, well, I don't think we declared them in memory and I don't think we, I also don't think we, well, therefore we didn't update the inputs either, did we? So up in memory then, because right position and left position, remember left position is negative 50 to zero, right position is zero to 50, right? Mm -hmm. But we don't have a marker strip variable. So, so maybe we can call it define in memory marker right as what? Boolean. Boolean. Mm -hmm. And define in memory marker left as what? Boolean. Still Boolean. So now I have a marker right and a marker left defined in memory as Boolean. Not letting you define the markers? No, so I, I put the markers in there and it wants to stop, but it doesn't stop. It just goes at a much slower crawl. <laughs> so here's the reason why. Here's my guess on that. Is I'm guessing what's happening is it is stopping, but it's stopping for that 10 millisecond of the loop. And that's all it's stopping for. So then the next time it goes a little bit and sees it again. Goes a little bit and sees again. So it's just crawling real slow through that marker strip. So we need to find a way to actually get it to stop for for greater than one scan, right? It needs to it needs to stop for a period of time. Can you just tell it to wait a period of time? Well, you could. Now that wait wait a period of time is going to work great in the simulator, Donald. What's going to happen if I put a wait of five thousand in the in the real motor controller? It's going to just crash. It's going to crash because <laughs> we have we have a watchdog in there. I can never remember what is it like five hundred milliseconds or something. Yeah. So yeah, so you might get away with you might get away with a, away with a weight of a thousand milliseconds. You might get away with a weight of two thousand milliseconds. But if you start putting ten thousand milliseconds or a ten second weight into the motor controller, we're going to struggle. Is what we're going to do. Blake had a question, I think. Oh yeah, I'm just trying to get a I'm going to have the timer because so I have my weight. I one, so it, like it's so fast that it can't. Figure out what seconds are. So, you, so like the timer showing like I'm going like at 30 seconds per act, one actual second. Yeah, you may want to you want to make yeah. make that wait 10. Yeah, that's the weird thing about that wait is that does affect the simulation, doesn't it? Yeah. It doesn't actually affect the simulation as the as the amount of time that runs. If you you know if you run a 30 second simulation, it's still a 30 second simulation. So if you and Andrew are running at the same same throttle, your vehicles are going to end up in the same spot. The only difference is it's going to look like yours is going a, a million miles an hour. You're going to get 30 seconds like that, yeah. and he's going to get 30 seconds like, you know, like that. He's going to be slower getting there, right? So do you care more that it stops 
stops or that it actually waits for five seconds? Well, here's what I care about. I care about that when it gets to the right, when it gets to the fork, digital input three on goes left, digital input three off goes right. When it gets to the marker, it stops and it waits for five seconds. Five seconds. Five full seconds. Is that real life five seconds or in here five seconds? Real life five seconds. You, okay. It's the same thing. They're the same thing. No, they are. They are because <laughs> let me let me show you what I mean. They they are the same thing. I know what you mean, but they're different. They're they're not. So <laughs> so like right now, let me show you what I mean there. If if I go right now and I run right, yeah, I've got a ten millisecond loop rate. Mm -hmm. The time it takes me to get to this right hand marker. If you look at the time in the upper left corner there, the time it takes to get to that right-hand marker, stop, is 3.5 seconds, set, set, yeah, three and a half seconds, right? Yeah. If I then go into my code and I make this a 100 millisecond wait, should have gone the other way, but if I make it a 100 millisecond wait, what you're going to see is it's still going to be three and a half seconds to get there. It's just the three and a half seconds is really slow. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. So it's not actual real like stopwatch time. It's three and a half seconds in simulator world time. Because if I look at what it, when I get to that strip right now, I'll pause it when it gets there. Right now, 3.5 seconds still. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Now the re now what you're talking about, part of the reason why it's wiggling right now is that I'm not updating as often. So what does that mean for my proportional gain? I'm not getting as many samples. I'm not updating as often, right? Um, and even if even if I speed this thing up even dramatically, and I go all the way down to a one millisecond on my weight. Now, if I take this all the way down to one, it's still one is much faster. Look how quick I'm going to get there. Doom, boom, 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 done. Three and a half seconds. So I'm looking for when it gets there and stops like that. If it got there at three and a half seconds, I don't want it to leave that location until eight and a half seconds. I don't care how fast your simulation runs, as long as the wait time at that marker is five seconds. So you want the simulated time to be five seconds. The you simulated, as far as we're concerned, that, that timer up in the top left corner is the real world timer. Okay. Regardless of whether it's, whether it's going faster than real seconds or slower than real seconds. That is your real time. Yep, yep. Now, did anybody come up with an idea of how to make it stop on the right marker? Yeah. What'd you do? I haven't done it. <laughs> <laughs> what are you thinking of doing? Stop on the right marker. Um, so, so we ended up putting in these other these other variables, right? We put in. Oh, did I lose them? You're in a different program. Oh, you're right. Um, what my thought was doing is having an if statement. If speed is that different speed, then uh, do this different thing. So yeah, so what we did was I defined a marker right and a marker left, right? And then I created another subroutine called marker strips. The only thing I didn't do was go in and build out marker strips. So I've got follow track, I've got update outputs, i got all these things in here that I've created. But I don't have I don't have a, a routine called marker strips, so this is where I might want to come in here and actually call marker strips. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna write it for you, but if somebody wants to give me an idea, I might type it in. And we'll see if it does anything. How would you start first of all? So how did we use the digital input? How did we call the digital input? Go take a look at that. We can go look at the digital input and see how we did the digital input. The digital input was if DIN3 equals true, then this. So really, this is the structure of my marker strips, right? I could just copy that. And I could say, OK, um, I could paste this in here. But instead of if DIN3 equals true, what's it going to be? Don't you have to declare? We did. We called it marker right up in the, the variables. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I created a defined to find a memory marker right as Boolean. But like actual like get value. Oh. Yeah, that's a good call. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have any marker right get value, do we? So what do we need to do? Can't you just put it right there and then 
Marker right. Yeah, I would agree with you there. That's a that's a good call there, by the way. Marker right equals get value, right? And do we remember what that was called? MGM. And marker right is two, is that right? Underscore MGM. Uh, yep, two. Comma two. Boom. Yeah, you're Nathan, you're right there. That, it's gonna be useless without that. <laughs> I mean, I can go read it all day long, but but if I if I if there's nothing to read, it, it's not going to do anything for me. So this is going to give me the value marker right, and the, the value is going to be boolean. It's going to be true or false. So now when I go into that marker right routine or that marker strips routine, I can now say if marker right is true is what I think I want to do. If marker right equals true. Now this is where it's going to get trickier. You know, do we do we say throttle equals zero? You know, could do we say? Well, are you trying to set that for the right, um, specifically the right ones, and wait the five thousand? Correct. Because you're not doing the, the very last one on the both sides, correct? Doing... Correct. I'm only I'm only looking at one of them right now. Yeah. So if marker right is true. Maybe this works. I don't know. Maybe if marker right is true, then I can do. Maybe I do this the set commands. Maybe I maybe I just do this. Maybe in here I go and and I set commands, but instead of setting the commands via throttle and steering, maybe I set command uh, G1, which is throttle, down to zero. Maybe I just do something like that. You can see that it looks like there's gonna be multiple ways to do this, right? Like it's uh steering probably doesn't matter a whole lot here. So I've already got steering. And the set command zero is just going to take care of my, my deal there. Else, if marker right is true, set command G1 to zero, you know, may, and maybe it's as maybe it's as simple as just waiting from there. You know, maybe I wait 500 milliseconds. And then maybe I set the command back to the throttle or something. I have no idea if this will work, to be honest with you. Looking at a lot of different things. Um, and I don't know if 500 milliseconds, the problem with 500 milliseconds can be problematic too because I need to have, I need to have enough of a weight to... Um, I probably need to clear that marker. Yeah, drive past it. So do, so do I need a weight here too, you know what I mean? So now that I've set the throttle on again, mm -hmm. so if the marker right is true, I'm just going to leave it like this for a second. I'm just going to, this may or may not work. I have no idea, but I'm going to grab it. But you guys can see the, the methodology I'm using. Again, I don't know if it's going to work. Um, I know that I know that I'm heading the right direction. So if I go back in here and I paste this in here again, let me build it and make sure this, I get no errors. That's always a good sign, right? You guys know the little hammers there, right? That's like a compiler. So when I compile this, I get zero errors, zero warnings. And now when I go to run it, it doesn't matter which fork I take because i got a right-hand marker on both the forks. So I'm going to follow the bottom fork here. I probably would want to update my console and maybe look at that marker too. Now it gets there. Look what it just did. Damn it, I'm giving you guys too much already. <laughs> I got lucky there, by the way. <laughs> Look what just happened, though. This is awesome. So it stopped. But it's never going to go again. Actually, it is going. <laughs> What's it doing? Cool thing. Oh, it's going. It's going to find the next one. Yeah, this is this is up. Uh, no, too quick. <laughs> so, so, so what just happened there? Are you trying to take a shortcut? Yeah, we tried to take a shortcut. But, but take a look at what happens here. It, it follows the right-hand strip, and it's going to get to this marker, and it's going to stop at the marker. I'll stand out of the way here for a second. And it stops. But then what happens is it comes back and loops after that weight, I think. What was my weight? Was my weight five seconds? Five seconds. <laughs> Yeah, see how it just moved a little bit? It's wiggling back and forth. And then so what it's doing is that, yeah, it doesn't have the time to clear that strip, does it? And it doesn't have a way to get off that strip, so much so 
that it's 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 no longer got any steering commands. So now all of a sudden we've lost our steering commands, and now we we just disappeared off the strip. So I think that might be the perfect place. If I go much further, I'm going to give you guys the solution to the whole thing, aren't I? <laughs> so that I'm not going to do. So what I'm going to do is just re review. Here's what this thing needs to do. It needs to hit that fork. Depending on the digital input, it needs to veer left or veer right. As soon as it hits that marker strip, it needs to stop and wait for five seconds, regardless of which path. Mm -hmm. When it hits the marker strip on the bottom, the left-hand marker strip, it needs to speed up. Now, when I go to grade this, what you're going to see is you're going to get graded on the pre-lab. The pre-lab is three points. That's easy. This is all stuff right out, of the, right out of the PowerPoint. Why do we only use digital input three and four? Because the other ones are used for the encoders. How can you uh, force it to go on one fork or the other? We, we just did that, right? All the different commands that we can use for that, the left side, the right side, uh, the digital in, the digital out, all of those are there. So the pre-lab questions out of the 10 points are worth three points. The, the digital input selecting the path is worth a point. We just did that. So everybody in here is going to get four points regardless, right? Because the pre-lab's good, and we already did the select the path. Waiting the five seconds at right-hand markers. That's going to be the little bit of a, we, we started to overcome it there. We got close. I gave you a little bit of a hint, gave you some ideas. You're going to have to play around with how am I going to actually get it to start and stop there, right? So that's another three points. That gets you up to seven. The vehicle speeding up along the bottom straight. That's worth one point. And then the vehicle charging station, 10 seconds. You'll also notice on the grading here, it defines what the normal speed is and what the fast speed is. So when you speed up along the bottom, I want it to be at 750 RPMs, everywhere else 250 RPMs. I don't necessarily care what you do to clear that marker as long as you maintain the strip. So if you stop for five seconds of the marker and it you know goes for 100 RPMs just to get clear of the strip, then it speeds up to 250, I'm fine with that. All right. But when it's navigating the strip, on the slow part of the course, it's at 250. On the fast part of the course, it's at 750. And then the last question, how are you going to determine when it's at the charging station? You're going to look for when marker right is true and marker left is true. That determines when you're at the charging station. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Questions? Can you put up your notepad when you're done? Yeah, yeah, I can put the notepad up. Did you cover asynchronous timers? Like get timer count, set timer count? Not yet. Not yet. That may come in handy. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you need it for this one, but but yeah, I, I think uh, Donald's on to some other ideas that could come in handy. Which one do you want to see there, Brett? Go up a little bit more. Just watch, uh, just up a little bit. Oh, down. oh you want you want to go the other way? Yeah, sorry. You're right next to inputs. Can you put that on the top, please? Like this? Correct. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, we, so what we got going was we did get it to stop. We just didn't get it to um, stop and go again. Mine kind of, mine stopped, but then instead of like winging out, it kind of just went forward and then it picked up and it went off. Well, that's, well, if you could get it to stop for five seconds. Well, it stopped, that was the thing, but then when it picked up, it just went really slow because it was like trying to think, and then it, when it found that yeah. the marker was false, it just shot yeah. around, so. Yeah, see, yeah, we're really, really, I mean, right now I tell you, you got the, the, the structure, the skeleton of the program is there. Um, you've got, you've got 50% of your code there, but I gave you the easy part of it. And so now you got, now you got to go play around and try to find some of the hard stuff that you got to work on there. So, all right, I'm going to stop the recording since we've got, uh, I think oh, that'll, that online? yeah, I'm going to put that online.